In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. If you will, prepare to turn in your Bibles to the Word of the Lord, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, and verse number 4. And then, if you will, thumbnail Second Corinthians, chapter 5, and verse number 19. I want to first of all give honor to Bishop Odom, to the Executive Council and its honorary members, and to the General Council of the Worldwide Pentecostal Fellowship. Wasn't Bishop Odom fantastic last night? Amen. He always leaves me feeling wow when he is done preaching. And last night was no exception. Incredible, incredible preaching of the Word of the Lord. I'm also very much looking forward to the ministries of Pastor Schweitzer and Buxton and Sheil and Archer and Urshan throughout the rest of this uh, conference. Of course, these men, as you well know, are all fantastic preachers in their own right. I, I do also want to express my fullest appreciation for the invitation to speak in this Thursday morning session. I feel blessed to be here. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 4. Probably most of you are unfamiliar with this text of Scripture, so I, I decided to talk about it for a little while today. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, and not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. My subject for you this morning is God in Christ and why it matters. God in Christ and why it matters. It matters. Uh, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people, Lord. This is a great people. They deserve to hear from you today. Dear Lord God, I pray you touch my mind and my mouth. Give me speech and utterance. Let the word of the Lord have free course. I pray, Lord, that you anoint me today. I need you. I need you. I need you. We love you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. I have divided my lesson this morning into two parts. Firstly, Shemaic conduct, and secondly, Shemaic creed. The term Shema is the Hebrew word for here, used in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 4. I will be using the term Shema as a synecdoche for Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, throughout the remainder of this lesson. Shema conduct, first of all, in this section of the lesson, this portion of the lesson this morning, I want to talk about the Shema as conduct. Because the Shema must flow out into life as conduct, it really matters. According to Jesus, the Shema is the first commandment. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 30. Or as Matthew puts it, it is the first and the great commandment. Matthew 22 and verse number 38. Therefore, by first, Jesus did not mean mere chronology. Rather, the Shema is the first commandment hierarchically. That is, it is the first commandment 
in order of importance. The Shema is the fountainhead and the bedrock of all oneness theology. Not only is the Shema the fountainhead and bedrock of all oneness theology, the Shema is the fountainhead and bedrock of all theology. All theology flows out of and rests upon the Shema, whether it be ecclesiology, eschatology, whatever the issue is, whatever the ology is, all of it is dependent upon the Shema. If the Shema is not true, then nothing else matters. But why does it matter? It matters for two reasons. First of all, the Shema touches every detail of life. And secondly, the Shema touches every doctrine of Scripture. Consequently, it affects both the conduct of saints as well as the creeds of Scripture. First of all, the conduct of saints. Not only is the Shema the Word's greatest creed, but it is also the world's greatest conduct. The Shema must be more than theoretical theology. The oneness of God must flow out of the pages of Scripture into the praxis or the practice of saints. As apostolics, we must not overemphasize Deuteronomy 6, 4 to Trinitarians while underemphasizing verses 5 through 9 to ourselves. While Trinitarians need a complete revelation of verse 4, we apostolics need a renewed revelation and revival of verses 5 through 9. The Shema is for apostolics too. And not just as a theological six-shooter that we brandish to debate showdowns with Trinitarians at high noon in Nicaea's town center. As apostolics, we need the Shema to be the guiding standard of every part of our lives. So I want to discuss some practical ways in which the Shema should inform the way we do life. Because the Shema is a commandment, it is something that we are to do and not just believe. Notice carefully Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Shema is something we are to do, verse 1, to keep, verse 2, and to observe in verse 3. We apostolics believe the Shema. We defend the Shema. We preach, sing, and shout about the Shema. But we do not always succeed at doing the Shema. So the question today is, how is one to do, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9 informs us how we are to do and not just believe the Shema. First of all, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and with all your mind. We must love the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, might, and mind. Deuteronomy 6, 5, Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, and Mark 12, and verse number 30. In short, all of us must worship all of Him. God, who from the beginning existed as Father, Word, and Spirit, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, and John 1, 1, and 1 John 5, 7, and incarnationally exists as Father, Son, which is Word made flesh and Spirit, created us in His image as soul, body, and Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. So again, all of man must worship all of God. The body, soul, and spirit of me must worship the Father, Word, and Spirit of Him. So all of me must worship all of Him or love all of Him. And of course, I mean love in the sense of devotional worship. So that we must not only love God, who is one, but we must love Him as one. As God's image-bearing creatures, we must worship the oneness of divine being out of the oneness of human being. We cannot just worship God with heart and soul and not worship Him with might and mind. 
We cannot just worship God with might and mind and not worship Him with heart and soul. We must worship God with our whole being. Many apostolics do not have a problem worshiping God with our heart, soul, and mind. That our might, that is emotionally and physically. But we sometimes struggle with worshiping God with our minds. We can emotionally and physically worship God at the drop of a beat. I mean, I've seen people cry their faces off in their hands and then throw them on the floor and dance on them. In the same service, we can go from one extreme to the other as we emotionally, with heart and might, worship God. But we don't always do so well at translating what we feel on Sunday night into how we think on Monday morning. We have bifurcated worship. We have compartmentalized commitment. We have divided devotion. But if we're going to truly be oneness, we not only have to worship the God who is one, but we got to worship Him as one. As one undivided human being. Worshiping God in the fullness of His one undivided divine being. So every part of me must worship Every part of God. We have the heart, might, and soul down pretty well in Pentecost. We have no shortage of shouters. We have no shortage of criers. But we do have a shortage a lot of times of people who have the ability to bring their mind under subjection to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The mind is the part that I want to focus on in this lesson, especially since I have incredibly limited time for such an incredibly unlimited subject. Now, while we must not reduce worship down to mere intellectual rigor, we must also... Not worship void of intellect. Humans are intellectual beings precisely because the one God in whose image we are created is the ultimate intellect and mind. Logos, which is in part mental reasoning and thought, is essential to God's being and how he interacts with and relates to his creation. John chapter 1 And verse number one, therefore, if all of man is going to worship all of God, then our human intellect must submissively worship his divine intellect. Now, I want to talk about today only one of the many ways that we should worship God with our minds, and that is in our occupations. We must begin, as Christians, we must begin to approach our occupations as Shemaic servants. To Shema adherents, everything we do, including our occupations, is sacred and nothing is merely secular. Paul argued in Colossians 3.17 that whatsoever we do in word or deed should bring glory to God and to the name of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, the the writer says that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And of course, we shout over this Shemach statement of Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. However, two chapters later, Paul applies that Shemach text to occupational labor. In chapter 4, he says there's only one Lord. And then in chapter 6, he tells us how we are to live out that one Lord. How we are to live out that faith in that one Lord. In Ephesians 6, 5 through 7, Paul says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not as I service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord. And not unto men. 
Now as to the Lord, which Lord? Obviously the Lord who is one in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 5. So even in our occupations, we are to labor as unto the Lord, doing the will of God from the heart. In other words, for Christians, our single service is to the one Lord of the Shema. Before we are employees of corporations, we are, in, we are servants of Christ. This is how the oneness of God must affect our work. And one way we are to live out the Shema in our occupations is to serve the one Lord of the Shema with our minds. This may include, and in many cases probably should, include collegiate education. Now, one can serve the one Lord with our minds without collegiate education, but we must not demonize formal collegiate education. Formal education may give one advantages that they likely would not have otherwise. Now, this has many applications, but I want to talk about two of them specifically. The first one is Christians and culture and how that relates to education and evangelism. Now, there is a revival in America known of atheism in America known as the new atheism. This revival of new atheism was brought to prominence by the four horsemen of atheism. Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, now deceased, Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. The four horsemen of new atheism are fundamental in their doctrine, and they are evangelistic in their fervor. Atheism is the religion that our kids will face. The apostolic evangelistic battle for revival in America is much bigger now than us versus the church across town. Increasingly, evangelism is going to be about dealing with agnostics, atheists, and even Islam. Now, while we must not ignore or underestimate the power of the Spirit and the working of miracles in evangelism, neither must we ignore the biblical command to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Oh, hallelujah. Instead of letting Trinitarians do all the work in the battle against atheism, why shouldn't apostolic apologists and theologians earn a seat at the public table and make credible contributions to the cultural war? We cannot continue to let Trinitarians do all of the major apologetic work, all the while complaining that Trinitarianism is the mainstream Christian position. If we are going to make a difference in our culture today, preachers, we must get involved in this arena. We must engage it. And we must do it not only spiritually, but we must do it intellectually. Before you dismiss this as irrelevant to you and your congregation, let me suggest to you that there are kids in your church and maybe in your own home, pastors, that are struggling with the fundamental issues of the existence of God and the veracity of Scripture. They may not be vocalizing their doubts, but many of our kids are having them anyway. And we have a responsibility to them to intellectually, yes, spiritually, but also intellectually, address their issues. I can preach this today with a particular passion because myself for many years have struggled with the very fundamental issues of faith, including the existence of God. Let me go ahead and just confess that I've even had that struggle this year. Forget about the struggle about which standards are important. I don't have no problem with that. The problem I deal with is whether or not there's a God. Because if there isn't a God, then none of the other stuff matters. It feels very weird sometimes walking to the pulpit. I know I'm scaring to death out of some of y'all. But I believe the Holy Ghost sent me here to talk to somebody that's in this session today. It feels kind of weird sometimes walking to a pulpit to preach a message about the oneness of God. 
And there's a voice in the back of your mind telling you he doesn't even exist. I know you're scared, but I'm not because I'm confident. I'm confident today that God is keeping me and that he who has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus. So what is the proper response to the culture and even Holy Ghost filled Christians who struggle with the fundamental issues of faith? We need a spiritual but intellectual response to the issues of faith. Yes, we must have a sovereign move of God with signs following. But let's not forget to worship the oneness of divine being with oneness of human being, which includes the mind. Now, secondly, let me talk to young preachers here today. Anybody under 40, can I preach to you today for just a little bit? We must engage the mind in our occupation known as the ministry or preaching. I hope that God will use what I'm about to say to stir up some passion in some young men in this building today. To be the best preacher you possibly can on every level. Let me stress at the outset of this portion of the sermon that we must have anointed and spiritual preaching. However, I must also stress that we need intelligent and thoughtful preaching. Intelligent and thoughtful preaching does not demand formal theological training, although that may help. However, intelligent and thoughtful preaching certainly requires reading and study. And I don't just mean reading nice, warm, fuzzy, sermon-illustrated books where you get quotes to preach some nice little story. I'm talking about studying the Word of God. I'm talking about seriously engaging theology. Seriously engaging the Word of God. This is why today I thank God for the accredited apostolic colleges that are now available to us, such as AST. Preachers, we need to be taking advantage of these educational resources as much as possible. And for the preachers who choose not to formally, theologically train for whatever reason, there are lots of things that we can do to sharpen our minds. There's almost an endless supply of theological resources that are readily available to us. We have no excuse for not taking preaching and theology seriously. We must do the best we can with the gifts and the resources that God has given us. It is our responsibility as preachers to labor in word and doctrine and to study so that we may rightly divide the word of truth. Yes, we must pray and fast, but we must also study and think. Notice what the writer said. He said, study to show yourself approved unto God. He didn't say pray to show yourself approved of God to rightly divide the word of truth. He didn't say fast to rightly divide the word of truth. You can pray all you want to. And that's essential to anointed preaching. But rightly dividing the word of truth only comes through the study of the word of God. Rightly dividing the word of truth is not one of the nine spiritual gifts. Yes, you have to pray and you have to study prayerfully, but you do have to study. Rightly dividing the word of truth demands that you study. Secondly, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. This is how we live out. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is how we do it and not just believe it. The Shema is the original children's story. The oneness of God must be of first importance as we teach our kids about Scripture. Number three, thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. If we are going to teach our kids and our children the Shema, we must Talk of it in our homes. This means that the Shema cannot be just the 
theology of tabernacles. It must also be the theology of the home. Because the Shema must be the theology of the home. It is the responsibility of parents and not just preachers to communicate its truth. In fact, the primary responsibility of teaching the Shema lies with parents and not with preachers. Amen. To inform our kids of the Shema. In reality, parents can and will teach the Shema in a way that pastors and preachers cannot. Unless, of course, pastor, preacher, and parent are one and the same. And even then, we will teach our children more about the Shema as parents than what we will as preachers. As preachers, we publicly preach about the Shema. But as parents, we should privately practice the Shema. And what we practice in private is going to be a much greater impact than what we preach in public. There are too many preachers' kids in our movement that are backsliding because they are disillusioned by clerical parents and particularly fathers who preach the Shema at church but do not practice the Shema in the home. As I already stated, the Shema's got to be more than creed. It's got to flow out into how we live. And how we live must begin in the example that we set before our kids in our home. As clerical parents and firstly as fathers, we need a shamanic revival that revolutionizes our private lives. It needs to revolutionize our private lives in such a way that our kids see us practice the Shema in private and not just preach it in public. And for this Shema revival to happen, everything in the home must be subject to the one Lord of the Shema. Everything in the home from books and board games to playstations and playlists must submit to Jesus Christ as the Lord of the Shema. Everything must pass the scrutiny of the Shema. And if anything conflicts with the Lordship of Jesus, then it is illegal in a Christian home. Not only must everything, but everyone in a Christian home must be subject to the one Lord of the Shema. The Shema should be the universal standard of the home. Not only must children be subject to Christ's Lordship, but so must parents. It must be unmistakable in a Christian home, and particularly in a preacher's home, that Jesus Christ is Lord over all, beginning with the household father. My family, if it's going to survive in the church, must come to know beyond shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ and not John Carroll is the final authority in my house. And that means that Jesus Christ decides what we read, what we wear, what we listen to, what we watch. And anything that challenges the Lordship of Jesus must go. And that is, we, we, don't, we cannot just expect submission to the Lordship of Jesus from our children and exempt ourselves from the Lordship of Jesus. If it is not flowing through the household, Father, your children will never get it. Oh God, there's too many rabbit trails that I could chase right now. Thirdly, or fourthly, we are to live out the Shema in everyday life as we walk by the way. Not only should the Shema be the guiding principle of the home, it should also be the guiding principle as we walk by the way. Not only should the Shema be our private confession, it must also be our public confession. Not only talk of it when we sit in our house, but we are to talk of it as we walk by the way. And if we talk of it as we walk by the way, it will change the way we walk by the way. Now, to the exciting part. Shemaic Creed. In the previous section, we discussed the oneness of God as conduct. Now let's discuss the oneness of God 
as creed. In the first part of this lesson, we discussed the why of the Shema, why it matters. Now let's discuss what the Shema is, or rather who the Shema is. What does the Bible have to say about the oneness of God? Our text in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And in that day there shall be one Lord and His name one. Malachi 2, 10. Have we not all one Father? Have not one God? Created us all. Mark 12, 32. For there is one God and there is none other but He. Romans 3, 30. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But unto us there is but one God. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. And James 2.19 says, if you believe there is one God, you're doing pretty good for the devils also believe and tremble. If that's all the Bible had to say about the oneness of God, it would be sufficient for us to believe what we believe. However, that is not all the Bible has to say about the oneness of God. What other terms does the Bible use to define God's oneness? Deuteronomy 32.39. See now that I, even I, am He, and there is no God with me. Second Chronicles 2 5, and the house which I will build is great, for great is our God above all gods. Isaiah 43 10, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I, even I, am He, and before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Isaiah 44 24, thus saith the Lord, Thy Redeemer and He that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and that spreadeth abroad the earth by Myself. Isaiah 45 and 6, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside Me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Isaiah 46 and 9, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like Me. The one God who is one one said, there's none with me, none above me, none before me, none after me. I'm alone. I'm by myself. There's none beside me. There is none else and there is none like me. You tell me, if God was trying to convey His oneness to humanity, how could He do it any plainer? Any more clear than the revelation of Himself that He has given us in Scripture? Oh my God, I feel like preaching in this house today. Now who is the one Lord of Shema? The one Lord of Shema is Yahweh the Father. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. And Isaiah 63, 16. And the one Lord of the Shema has revealed Himself incarnationally in and as the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the early oneness Pentecostal adherents meant by the phrase, the mighty God in Christ. A phrase which appears to be popularized, to have been popularized by G.T. Haywood. And of course, he heavily influenced his contemporaries. And that terminology in contemporary, in contemporary times has flowed down to us. They understood that phrase, that is the mighty God in Christ, to mean that Christ was the incarnational revelation of God Himself. The phrase God in Christ is explicitly scriptural Language that captures the idea that Yahweh of the Old Testament revealed Himself in and as Jesus in the New Testament. 
John 14, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, Ephesians 4, 32, Colossians 1, 19, 2, 9, and 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. Now, for the duration of this sermon today, I want to focus specifically on the deity of Christ. Now, I realize that there is much conversation that could and should be had about the nature of the Incarnation, particularly the relationship between the Father and the Son. Let me say for clarification, however, that the distinction between Father and Son must be understood in an incarnational context. For oneness apostolics, we must not see the Son as an eternally pre-existent God the Son, as a distinct person from God the Father. But that is a conversation... For another time. For now, we'll just focus specifically on the identity of Jesus as God in the Scriptures. I'm going to do this in three ways. One, Old Testament fulfillment in, New Tes- in the New Testament. Two, direct statements of the deity of Jesus. And thirdly, the worship of Jesus. These three concepts in Scripture prove explicitly that Jesus is the revelation of the one God of the Old Testament. Now, firstly, Old Testament, New Testament fulfillment. The prophecy is Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And Jehovah God said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only Son. And of course, that was fulfilled in John chapter 19 and verses 34 and 37 when they pierced Jesus on the cross. In John 19, John invoked Zechariah 12 and applied it to Christ. According to John, Christ fulfilled the Lord's prediction that the house of David would pierce Him. The meet Him language that the Lord used in Zechariah was prophetic and precise. He said, they shall look upon me whom they appears, and they shall mourn for him. And when they mourn for him, is when they pierce me. In other words, Jehovah God of the Old Testament looked all the way down through time to the cross and said, the me is him. And the Him is me. I only got time for one illustration. Now, the direct statements of the deity of Jesus. We cannot talk about this without mentioning Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, and the Everlasting Father. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John twenty twenty eight. Thomas looked at Jesus and said, My Lord and my God. Romans 9, 5, whose are the... Fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is God over all, blessed for ever. Titus 2.13 says we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1.8, but unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, I cannot take the time to discuss these passages individually, but suffice it to say that they explicitly declare that Jesus Christ is God. And since there is only one God, and that one God is the one Lord God of the Shema, in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, Jesus is the incarnational and personal self-revelation of the one Yahweh God the Father. Now, Jesus is to be worshipped as God because He was not is the incarnational, to repeat myself, personal self-revelation of the one Lord God of Shema. And that one Lord God of the Shema is Yahweh the Father. Jesus is not God the Son incarnate. Jesus 
is God the Father incarnate in and as the Son of God. And let me briefly say that the Son of God was more than human nature. He was a complete man. He was human in body, soul, and spirit. The Son was God the Father, flowing out of Himself and existing incarnationally as a full, complete human. In Christ, God Himself enters fully into the human condition and stands in solidarity with His image-bearing creatures as the unique express image of the Father's person. In Genesis 1.26, Hebrews 1 and verse number 3. And because Jesus was God the Father incarnate, He was worshipped as God even during His incarnation. The incarnational worship of Jesus as God was and is not idolatry as Jesus was more than a man. He was God-man or theanthropos. He is God-man. Another way to state the worship of Jesus is that it is the worship of the Father in the name and in the person of Christ. According to John 4.24, True worship is the worship of the Father. For they that worship the Father must worship Him, John 4.23, must worship Him in spirit and in truth, for God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Yet, true worship was given to Jesus. How can these two propositions be true at once? That true worship belongs to the Father. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. That true worship is given to Jesus. How do we harmonize these two concepts? The answer is in God in Christ. Let's look at the incarnational worship of the Father in and as the name and person of Jesus. Jesus argued in John 5.23 that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Now this verse is not suggesting that all men honor the Son as an eternal, pre-existent, distinct, divine person from the Father, yet equally with the Father. Rather, it is suggesting that all men are to incarnationally worship the Father in the name and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the exact point that Paul makes in Colossians 3.17. And whatsoever you do in word and deed, do all in the, what? In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto the Father by Him. If you're gonna worship God the Father, you gotta worship God the Father in the name and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Specifically in an incarnational and Christian context. Now, other verses that say we to worship God in the name and in the person of Jesus. Romans 1.8. Ephesians 5.20. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Hebrews 13.15. 1 Peter 2.5. 1 Peter 4 and 11. Now, we are to give thanks to God the Father by Jesus, not merely as representative or agent. But because God the Father incarnationally indwells Jesus, the Son, in absolute fullness. 2 Corinthians 5.19, Colossians 1.19, and Colossians 2.9. And because Jesus, as the Son, is the express image of the Father's person. Hebrews 1.1-3. And because Jesus, as the Son, is the Father incarnate. John 1.1 and verse number 14. John in Revelation makes this point powerfully. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders. That must have been the, the board, the elders board, the beast. And the elders. I wouldn't dare say it was the elders' wives. You're not going to get me to say that for... Not for a minute, you're not going to get me to say that. 
And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands. And thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Every creature that is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, honor, and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Revelation 5, verses 11 to 13. Notice that every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth, gives the same blessing, honor, glory, power to God and the Lamb. However, this is not suggesting that honor, glory, and power and blessing are divided between two divine persons, God and the Lamb. Rather, God and the Lamb are to be worshipped as one. For there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. That His and Him modify God and the Lamb. In this text, God and the Lamb have one name and one face. Because God incarnationally indwells Christ in fullness, the Lamb was the face of the Father, and the Father's glory shines in and through the face of Jesus Christ. Therefore, God and the Lamb are the His and the Him that sits on one throne. As John said in Revelation 4-2, a throne was set in heaven and one sat thereon. And the one that sat on the throne was God and the Lamb. The primitive church Christianized Jewish monolatry to include God and Christ in the worship of the one God of the Shema. See Romans 11.36 and 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 6. This is true because they view Jesus as the incarnational and personal presence of the one God of the Shema. So my point is this. If one as a Christian is going to worship God, you must worship Him in and as the name and the person of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Do I have any Jesus worshipers in the house today? I worship Jesus today because He's equal with God. The apostle says of Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. This verse at least implies, if not explicitly states, that Jesus is equal with God. Either way, it makes my point, which is, Jesus is equal with God. Now, Trinitarians often use this verse as a proof text for the eternal pre-existence of the Son as a distinct divine person of uh, the Father. However, this point misses the Old Testament motif of who is equal with God. In Isaiah 46 and 5, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? Here God asks, as a me, not an us, who is equal to me or like me? God never asked a question about Himself that He doesn't also give the answer. He said in verse 9, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. No wonder Paul had the audacity to say that Jesus is equal with God. Oh, hallelujah. Man, i got a lot of material here. i got to rush, though. And because Jesus is equal with God, Acts 20, 28 says... He's, he has God's blood. Acts 20:28, 20, God's church. Luke 11:20, He's got God's finger. John 1:14, He has God's glory. Hebrews 1:3, He has God's image. John 17:11, He has God's name. Philippians 2:6, God's nature. Matthew 28:18, God's power. And John 5:19, He has God's works. Surely, anybody with God's blood, God's church, God's finger, God's glory, God's image, God's name, and God's nature has got to be God. I worship Jesus today because He is exalted above all. Wherefore God hath highly exalted Him and given Him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
fact, he is exalted so high that he's exalted far above all principality and might and dominion and every name that is named. In fact, Jesus said of Himself in the book of the Apocalypse, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I worship Jesus today because He's greater than Adam. Is Jesus greater than Adam? You better believe He's greater than Adam. For the first Adam was a living soul. But the last Adam is a quickening spirit. The first Adam was of the earth earthy. But the last Adam was the Lord from heaven. I worship Jesus today because He's greater than Abraham. Is Jesus greater than Abraham? You better believe He was. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. And before Abraham was, I am. I worship Jesus today because He's exalted above the angels. Is He higher than the angels? He had by inheritance received a name more excellent than they. Therefore, let all the angels of God worship Him. And if the angels of God have to worship Him, what's your excuse? tread where angels fear to trot. It said, let all the angels worship. That includes the pastoral angels of Revelation 120. If your church is going to be a Jesus worshiping church, it's got to have a Jesus worshiping angel. I worship Jesus today because He's greater than John. Is He greater than John? You better believe He is. John said, He that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. All John did was preach about the Holy Ghost, but Jesus pours out the Holy Ghost. I preach to you today because he's greater than Jonas. Jesus said in Mark 12, Matthew 12, 41, Behold, a greater than Jonas is here. See, if I preached that, I'd be lying. Jesus was preaching that about himself, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is the one that said, Behold, a greater than Jonas is here. But like we used to say on the basketball court, if you can back it up, it ain't bragging. Jesus said, Behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Is he greater than Jonah? Yeah, Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of a well. But Jesus, after three days and nights in the heart of the earth, raised his own self from the dead. I worship Jesus today because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 42, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Is he greater than Solomon? You better believe he's greater than Solomon. Because when I preach about Solomon, I say he had wisdom from God. But when I preach about Jesus, I say he's the wisdom of God. I worship Jesus because He's greater than the temple, Matthew 12, 6. He's a greater hope than the law, Hebrews 7, 19. He's a greater testament than the law, Hebrews 7, 22. He's a greater promise than the law, Hebrews 8, 6. He's a greater sacrifice than the law, Hebrews 9, 23. He's a greater resurrection than the law, Hebrews 11, 35. And He has greater blood than the law. However, the ultimate power of worship is not in the worshipers, but He who is worshipped. You see, when angels were worshipped, they gave the angelic response, said, don't worship us, worship God. When the apostles were worshipped, they said, don't worship us, worship God. However, Jesus was also worshipped. Three minutes, I'm done, and I apologize. You realize how many pages I I skipped over? Jesus 
was worshipped by wise men in Matthew 2.11. He was worshipped by lepers in Matthew 8.2. He was worshipped by a ruler in Matthew 9.18. His disciples worshipped Him, Matthew 14.33. A woman of Canaan worshipped Him, Matthew 15.55. A mother and her sons worshipped Him, Matthew 20.20. A man with a legion of demons worshipped Him. In John 9, and a former blind man worshipped Jesus. In, I'm sorry, in John 9, Mark 5, demons, a legion of demons worshipped Him. But why did the above mentioned worship Jesus? Because Jesus is the wisdom of God. He's academic and philosophical enough that even wise men can worship Him. Because Jesus was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows. He's lowly enough that a leper can worship Him. Because Jesus is God of gods, King of kings, and Lord of lords. He's authoritative enough that even a ruler can worship Him. Because Jesus was a teacher come from God, His own disciples worshipped Him. Because Jesus was Israel's Messiah to the nation. A Gentile woman of Canaan can worship Him. Because Jesus is the Ancient of Days, the mother can worship Him. But because He was begotten of God, her sons can worship Him. Because Jesus, because Jesus was... The Creator and Lord over demons. Even a man possessed by a legion of them can worship Jesus. And because Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, even a blind man can see that Jesus is to be worshipped. After wise men worshipped Jesus, they mocked Herod. Because when you worship God in Christ and as Christ, it changes how you see everybody and everything else around you. When lepers worshipped Jesus, He cleansed them. When the ruler worshipped Jesus, He raised His daughter from the dead. When His disciples worshipped Him, He calmed their storm. When the woman of Canaan worshipped Him, He cured her daughter who was grievously vexed of a devil. And blind men worshipped Jesus when He healed them. You see, when the apostles were worshipped, they gave the man response. When angels were worshipped, they gave the angelic response. But when Jesus was worshipped, He gave the God response. He responded in a way that only God could and would. I don't know about you today, but I'm glad I've got the revelation in this house that Jesus was more than just a man. Jesus is the mighty God. He's the one true and living God of the Old Testament, revealed personally, incarnationally, in and as the name and the person of Jesus Christ. There is only one God. He is in Christ, and it matters. We have to identify what a Christian is, what a Christian truly really is. Now, if I were to ask you, hey, brother or sister, what is a Christian or what does the word Christian mean? I'm not going to ask you because I'm afraid you might tell me it means Christ-like. If you tell me the word Christian means Christ-like, all that simply means is you never looked it up. You didn't look in the dictionary or the lexicon. And my mama taught Susie, my sister and I, don't use words you haven't looked up because you might be using the word wrong. So the word Christian does not mean Christ-like. On page 672, column 1, paragraph 3 of the Greek-English lexicon of New Testament words by Joseph Henry Thayer, he said the word Christian is from the Greek word Christianos, and it means follower and worshiper of Jesus Christ. A Christian is somebody who follows and worships Jesus. Because in reality, we don't know nobody just like Jesus. Jesus Christ has never been duplicated and never been replicated. A follower and a worshiper of Jesus is a Christian. So the Bible says in Matthew 4 and 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You serve the God that you worship. I can hang out with anybody. That's why Evangelist Green, it was a treat to hang out with you. I can hang out with anybody 20 minutes. I will tell you who your God is because you serve the gods you worship. If you worship money, 
You serve your business or your job or whatever you do to get money. If you worship fashion, you serve clothes. If you worship education, you serve degrees. If you worship knowledge, you serve science. If you worship your body, you serve exercise. If you worship your belly, you serve food. If you worship lust, you serve sex. If you worship getting high, you serve alcohol. If you worship yourself, you serve pride. If you worship sin, you serve the devil. Let me admonish you, worship God and serve Jesus. Jesus is the only legitimate object of worship in the entire world. Though our sins are scarlet, you have made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you have made us white as snow.